When we take a look at our network, we say, let's find the optimal values to go in W1 and W2 that will give us the lowest possible loss value. Now, there's a field of maths called optimization, which we'll call on to help us in this process. We'll dig into that topic in a very, very rudimentary kind of way in this video. Now, what we're going to do is create a new code block at the bottom of this uh, file here. So press plus code. And we're going to import another package. It's called matplotlib, which we use for making graphs from data. And we're going to introduce a subsidiary of it called pyplot. We're going to import all of that as PLT just to make it easier to write out later. So pyplot is basically the graph plotting module that everyone uses for Python. And we're going to write up a, a simple mathematical function now. Y equals X to the power of 2. And then we're going to display a graph of it using pyplot. It's a slight diversion, but it's, uh, I guarantee it'll be worthwhile in the end. So firstly, we need to generate an X axis. This is usually just a line of numbers which we can generate in NumPy by writing X equals NumPy dot A range. Let's write negative 8, 8 and then 0 0.1. So that's creating a range of numbers from negative 8 to, to positive 8 and the interval between each number will be 0 0.1. You can print that out if you like, just so you know what you're working with. There you go. A mathematical function that we were going to write, we can write out as function equals x to the power of 2. So that's the symbol that we use to represent uh, an exponential. And convention, as you may know, has it that we call this function y. Let's print out y and then run the file again. Okay, so we're on track. Now to show our graph, type in plt.plot and then our values, which are x and comma y. And lastly, we need to write plt.show. We'll get rid of that print value there. Made a little error there, get rid of that. And voila, there is your graph. So y equals x to the power of 2. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. The slope of this function is different depending on where we are in the function, right? So here, uh, when x equals 2, the slope looks like that, roughly. When x equals 4, the slope looks like that, and so on. Now, let me tell you that when x equals 2, the slope is 4. That means for every one increase in x, y will increase by 4. So just to confirm that, let's type in z equals 4 times x. So that's a function with slope of 4. And we'll add that to our graph as well. So comma x comma z run the file again so can you see that when x equals 2 this is x here when x equals 2 the slope of our original function is the same as this new function with a slope of 4 now what if i told you there's a different function that will tell us what the slope of this curve is no matter if we are here in the function here here or anywhere and for this curve, that mystery function is 2 times x. So when x equals 2, the result of this mystery function will be the slope of our function at that point. And, of course, the result will be 4. So this mystery function here is said to be the derivative of this function y equals x to the power of 2. And as a general concept, it can really come in handy if we want to find the minimum value of a function. Because if we step back for a moment, remember how we want our loss function to give the lowest possible output? Just keep that in the back of your mind as we go deeper into this discussion. So the thing is, if we know the derivative of a function, then with a random location as our starting point, 
we can calculate the slope, then we should be able to take a short step in the direction of the slope downward to head tentatively toward the minimum output of the function. Right, so if we are here and we have the derivative of the, of the function telling us that the slope looks like this, then if we change the input value so that we move slightly this way, we know we're going to be heading to a lower output. It seems pretty obvious for such a simple curve, but imagine if this was a horrendously wobbly line and we, we didn't know how to possibly achieve the lowest output for the function. This is a, a fairly safe and effective method for finding the minimum possible output. But that all does sound a bit vague, no doubt. We'll be moving on to how to practically implement it in a second. It is easy, having said all that, for a single variable function like this, which only has two dimensions. But let's introduce a third dimension now. In order to do this, we have to import another module up top. So type in from MPL underscore toolkits dot mplot 3D import axes 3D. So before we had y equals x to the power of 2, let's make a new function that is z equals x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2. We won't go into the details too much, but uh, here's how we chart that up with NumPy and Matplotlib. So we have x equals NumPy dot a range, blah, blah, blah. We'll also make y the same because we need two number lines going in, in, uh, in those two dimensions there. And now type in x comma y equals numpy dot mesh grid x comma y, which just conveniently generates coordinates for us. Then we have our function here. And for fancier graphs like this one we're about to make, we need to push matplotlib a little further. So comment out these two lines here and type in axes equals plt.axes and then in brackets projection equals 3D. So that's saying we want a 3D graph and then we want to add in our function. We do this by typing in axes dot plot surface x comma y comma z comment that line out as well run the file and there you go pretty cool huh now you should be able to see in there that the the minimum value produced by this function is right in the middle there that's at uh, zero in the x and y planes but say based on the input values that we put through, we ended up with an output that landed us up this valley around here. Now, if we wanted to take a step in the direction of this valley, it will help for us to know the derivative of each of these variables, x and y. So to take a step towards this valley, we'll need to know the derivatives in the x dimension and in the y dimension. And when we put those derivatives together, we'll get an idea of where we need to step in the context of the overall function. So going back to our code, our original function, which we got rid of, only operates on one variable. So we call it a single variable function. And then this was the derivative of that function. Nice and easy. This function, on the other hand, is in the category of multivariable functions because it has more than one variable. And for multivariable functions, we can calculate derivatives for each constituent variable. We can get the derivative for x and the derivative for y. And it's convenient for us then to pack this set of derivatives into a single list or matrix even. The collection of derivatives for a multivariable function we call the gradient of the function. And each of these derivatives we call a partial derivative. 
because they're each only part of the overall function. And then another way we write these partial derivatives is as follows. It's using that del symbol, which I'm just going to grab from Google now. There it is. So another way we write these individual partial derivatives is as del z over del x. That's the partial derivative with respect to the x variable. And then del, oops, del z over del y. And when the function is as simple as ours was, it's a piece of cake to work out what these partial derivatives are. We just work out the derivative of the value in question and then we just leave the other one as is. So what that means is that del z over del x just equals 2x or 2 times x plus y to the power of 2. It's the same as the derivative of x down there, plus we're keeping y as is. As for del z over del y, that will be x to the power of 2 plus 2y. So going back to our graph, in the x plane, this derivative will give us the slope at any point in time. And in the y plane, this derivative will give us the slope at any point in time. And the collection of partial derivatives for a function is called the gradient. And the gradient can tell us what the slope of the function is in all of its dimensions at any point in time. And then we can use that information to take a step towards the minimum output for the function. In an earlier video, we mentioned that the only values we'll be looking to modify in our network will be those in the weights matrices. So our essential goal will be to find the gradient of the output function with respect to these weights matrices. And then we can change the values in the weights matrices in such a way that we should produce a lower output for our function overall. Join me in the next video to find out how.